My first tattoo looks like the start of a very pious diaper. <laughs> the original design was a simple line drawing of a safety pin that I drew on my hand for about four years before I was old enough to step foot in a tattoo shop. Freshly legal and full of borrowed righteousness, I had every intention of believing in God for forever. I'd come a long way in four years from my tween age dwelling into Wicca, witchcraft for the crafty, to a bleeding heart Christian doing outreach work in the dodgy parts of the big city on the weekend. I grew up listening to my older siblings' CDs by intercepting 70s British punk icons before they made it to the trash. Elton Motello told me how he was going to make his ex be a girl and take her around the world long before I had any idea what gonna make you penetrate meant. <laughs> By the time I made it to high school, I was the stereotypic stereotypical punk of suburbia. I believed I was my own force of nature, but every cliche was applicable. The studs on my bracelets were probably hammered by malnourished children in Malaysia. My combat boots were held together with duct tape I sharpied black, even though it drove my mom crazy that I wouldn't just wear the new shoes she bought me. And worst of all, I bought my social distortion shirt before I knew they were banned. I wasn't about to take crap from anyone. The first boy that got to learn I'd rather use my fists than my words was probably surprised at the velocity in which his comeuppance came. He sat behind me on the bus and was delighting his cohorts by making fun of how much makeup I wore. Not to play into their stupid game, I sat there and ignored him. I had a short temper, though. After a minute of him rambling, I spun, slammed my knuckles into his head, his head into the metal divide of the bus window, and promptly resumed my seat in calm demeanor. I remember how cool the breeze was as I sat up and turned to face him, how natural the movement came to tense my back and punch through his head, not just collide with it. <laughs> I followed through so well that my fingers raked against the front the front of his face before I cut my knuckles on the window. I was no expert, but I thought somebody had to hit you back for it to be a real fight. My friends and I tried. We'd spend the night at each other's houses, borrowing boxing gloves and knocking each other around. One night, we got to play around with an audience. My best friend, who shares a first and middle name, as well as a similar height, and I circled each other for a fourth round. Who am I kidding? We didn't keep track of rounds. I was there for the adrenaline, and I wanted it as painfully as I could get it. I wouldn't block my face, and she kept landing these one-twos that rattled the gray lumpy mass in my skull in just the right way. People standing around us kept telling me that I needed to block, but I didn't know how, and I was too stubborn to admit it. I liked feeling anything but neediness. At what I thought was the apex of my badassery, I yelled back, I don't ever need anything. <laughs> yeah, I really didn't need to be protecting myself from any further brain injuries. The little battles I had with my friends were so much more rigorous than when I almost got myself suspended for two fights I got into homecoming weekend. It, this was 2005, and Chris Pontius started a skit on the TV show Jackass called Party Boy. He would strip down to a thong and hump the leg of unsuspecting grown men. For months after the show started, boys in my high school took to replicating this act, mostly incorrectly, because they were after girls, but at least they didn't strip. My little sister's boyfriend started to joke that he was going to party boy me. I thought he was a nice guy, sweet and intelligent. In front of our mutual group of friends, I guess he felt like he had to entertain them. And even though I used plain English, he didn't fully grasp the ramifications of his actions. <laughs> he started to grind his pelvis closer and closer to me until I landed a haymaker on his brainwashed temple. Sadly, I'd have to teach the same damn lesson to my date the following evening. He was tall, though, and I didn't feel the uppercut connect. I thought the party boy antics were offensive, and it seemed like no one else I knew shared my lack of humor in the matter. I expanded my search for comrades and found a small group of reformed bad kids gone to God. See, I felt like a liar. I feigned a tough persona, but I didn't stand up for myself with, do, 
douchebags with a camera interrupted my first time having sex. I was ashamed, so I ditched my old friends for ones that I could start over with. We didn't have sex, do drugs, or drink, so our little teenage selves were left with coffee, cigarettes, and trespassing. <laughs> Most nights we'd go to one coffee shop, talk for a couple hours, and eventually make our way to IHOP to close the evening. When the weather wasn't confusing itself for a woman going through menopause, we explored the big city and they showed me places I had no idea existed, probably because we were rarely supposed to be there. At the center of town, there was a wildlife exhibit I recalled visiting on an elementary school trip. The highlight of that trip were some super frisky turtles that teachers eventually gave up trying to hide from our precious prepubescent minds. My new friends and I took a midnight stroll around the grounds that closed at dusk and peeked in at the sleeping birds and amphibians. There was no lack of signage stating the closed hours of the exhibit, but with no gate and no attendees, it was a breeze to get to the beaver exhibit. On a dare, one of us tried to pet the beaver. <laughs> the next thing we know, an alarm wails and a perturbed voice comes over the loudspeaker to inform us, you are trespassing, stay in the area, authorities are on their way. We looked around for any guards coming our way, and as the recording began to loop, we burst into tearing laughter. Who makes an audio recording that warns people authorities are coming? If they wanted to catch us, wouldn't they have a silent alarm? I loved ripping apart the effectiveness of the city's beaver security system. <laughs> because it was finally a moment I could feel that adrenaline pump without risking my neck or hurting anyone. Falling in with those friends gave me the distance I needed from my peers. It allowed me to feel safe and accepted into a clan of gracious malcontents. So when I walked into that tattoo shop, I felt like I was getting a badge of adulthood. I picked through their portfolios before I decided whose work I wanted on my body. And when I met Scott, he seemed nice, but also kind of greasy in that maybe you're a creep when you aren't at work way. He took my sketchbook to copy the design I drew up, and while he had the opportunity, flipped through my recent work. I was offered an internship that day, but turned it down. In the shop full of mirrors, I looked at my reflection over his shoulder, and I knew I was on my way to art school in the fall. I had my whole life figured out, and while grateful, declined. I laid back on the dark blue padded table and felt my skin suction cup to the plasticky veneer. I felt uncomfortable as he tucked in the paper film to protect my clothes from the ink, but this was a tattoo I'd planned for four years. I wasn't about to turn back. My whole body was acutely aware of what was coming next. Oh, wow. Oh, ow, ow, wow. Uh, oh, wow, that hurts. Oh, my dear God, that hurts. I am not, I am not a badass. <laughs> I thought to myself as I felt a tattoo gun deposit ink so quickly into my skin that I couldn't even see the needle. I focused on my breathing so I wouldn't seem like such a pansy. And then something weird happened. It started to tickle. At some point, I moved past the pain and my nerves were trying to tell me anything but the pain they were going through. I think sometimes when people mark themselves, it's to aim for an ideal they might not be yet. That's what I did. I felt like a terrible person for being so weak, for being such a hypocrite, for fighting people, but not the people that I really wanted to get back at. I thought devoting my heart to God would make me a good person, but it didn't. I wanted my sins forgiven, and letting a fluffy bearded fellow in the sky do the work was the quick wash I accepted. It took several more years before I could do the important part, forgive myself. I don't remember the exact time and place I stopped relying on an unchanging system, but eventually the unanswered questions I had burned too brightly not to be answered. I saw a pattern in progress. Religion was used as an explanation for things in science I had not found the reasons for yet. The new friends I needed at the time didn't believe in evolution. That was a significant, but not the only deal breaker. They lived in a different reality, and I couldn't reconcile how these smart people could turn a blind eye to legit facts. We all moved away from that small town and grew apart. I have other tattoos now I use as goalposts. And even as an atheist, I'm still quite fond of that first tattoo. I know eventually the tattoo that covers a quarter of my body will not always be the best definition of what I believe in, but it's still important for me to remember. I mark myself to solidify temporary understandings of who I am. Right now, I'm waiting for gift tattoos to come out so I can embrace my spirit animal, <laughs> Diane Cat. Thank you.